organic, unpredictable, unknown, lovely, beautiful, a sense of fulfillment. This is part of the pleasures of life and not the chores of life. Coming up on Daily Iowa TV, we'll give you a recap of the Super Bowl and how the Indianapolis police contain the crowd. And see how a new labor law could ban kids from working on the family farm. And in sports, find out where Iowa's offensive coordinator Ken O'Keefe is taking his talents. That's all coming your way next. Daily Iowa TV starts now. From Studio 151, your television news, sports, and weather source for the Daily Iowan, this is Daily Iowan TV. TV. I'm Christina Targos. And I'm Brad Maxwell. Fans didn't just enjoy the game itself Super Bowl Sunday night. The ads alone can cause people to tune in. Here at the UI, graduate marketing students watched and graded the ads at the Hawkeye Hall of Fame, basing their scores off which ad ads made them most likely to buy the product. More than 60 students participated, and the top winner was ranked the M&M's commercial, followed closely by the Honda commercial starring Ferris Bueller. Finishing out were the top five were Chevrolet's high school graduation ad, E-Trade's Talking Baby, and Doritos Slingshot Baby. An Iowa City man is being charged for several thefts and burglaries committed last year. Police say 21-year-old Ricky Frederick broke into several homes over the course of 2011 in Iowa City, stealing items from blank checks to cell phones. Police reports say the stolen blank checks from one victim turned up after they were used to pay a phone bill of Frederick's child's mother. Officials say another theft of two cell phones and a purse turned up after call records showed calls being made to Frederick's family and he admitted to finding the stolen items. Police say all stolen items are valued to about $1,300 and were found in Frederick's home. U.S. Rep representatives, government officials, and farmers are teaming up to fight the Department of Labor and Wage. Daily Iowa TV's Josh Bolander has more. In October of 2010, the Iowa Department of Agriculture recognized four Johnson County farms as century farms, meaning that the same family had farmed on the same land for more than 100 years. Now less than two years later, these same farms are fighting rules and regulations that could change the way they operate. The U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division announced it will repropose its regulations on child labor laws and agriculture after receiving extremely negative feedback from the U.S. farming community. U.S. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack attributed the government's response to farmers across the country, as well as the more than 150 representatives that blasted regulations restricting those under the age of 16 from performing everyday family farm tasks involving animals such as boars, bulls, and horses, as well as certain safety precautions. The restrictions could be very detrimental to family farms in Iowa as well, especially those run in Johnson County. Of the estimated 2 million family farms in the U.S., 5% are run in Iowa, and nearly 87% of the farms in Johnson County fill into this category. With the average size of these farms listed at nearly 240 acres, and average expense reports listed just over $76,000 a year annually, a slash in labor could be devastating. Luckily for Iowa farmers, Governor Terry Branstad is passionate about maintaining the norm, going on record as calling the rule a prime example of federal overreach. Josh Bolander, Daily Iowan TV. According to a statement by the D USDLW, the department's Child Labor and Agriculture Statutory Authority extends to children employed on their farms who are aged 15 years or younger. According to the Associated Press, Iowa health officials will appeal an Iowa law that requires both names of same-sex couples to be listed on a child's birth certificate. This stemmed from a Des Moines couple that sued the Iowa Department of Public Health after only one of the parents' names was listed on the birth certificate. The couple argues that listing only one parent deprives that child of the benefits of having two legal parents. Still to come on Daily Iowan TV, we'll take a look at U.S. foreign policy related to the violence in Syria. Then later in sports, Jamie Printy suffered a season-ending injury. Find out what happened. And now let's go to Jordan Slack in the weather studio. And Jordan, even though we haven't seen much snow yet this February, it's still been pretty cold. Is it too soon to start counting down the snowless days until spring break? Well guys, unfortunately, those relatively dry conditions may be coming to an end here. There's about a 30% chance of rain or snow throughout the daytime on Tuesday. In the morning, expect a chilly 28 degrees and a chance of freezing rain until about 8 a.m. By midday, that rain will likely turn to snow and it'll only warm up to about 32 degrees. 
Then, Tuesday evening, the precipitation will move out and some cloud coverage should roll in. Expect it to get down to a chilly 28 degrees overnight. Looking ahead, we've got some sunny days to come, but don't let that fool you because temperatures will hover in the 20s and 30s as we make our way into the weekend. Temps look to start warming up slightly at the end of the weekend and on into next week. So that's what you guys can expect for the next few days. Back to you. International tensions are rising over the uprising in Syria. Daily Iowa TV's Ryan Jones examines the conflict in the, in the political update. Thanks, Brad. Now, both China and Russia both used their ability to veto on Saturday when they vetoed a U.N. Security Council's action to condemn Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Now, both Russia and China are defending their choices to veto, claiming it's an issue of serious state sovereignty and not that they are protecting their own country's self-interest. China does not accept the accusation. China does not have its own self-interest on the issue of Syria. We do not deliberately shelter or oppose any country. Instead, we uphold justice in dealing with the issue. As a responsible great power, China will continue to work with the international community and play a positive and constructive role in dealing with the current issue in Syria. The leadership in Syria has taken the vetoes as a sign that the world still sees Syria as legitimate. The uprising has now claimed over 6,000 lives, being one of the bloodiest in the Arab world. And the American government is blaming China and Russia for the continuation of the bloodshed. What happened on Saturday when Russia and China chose to veto a resolution that most importantly would have given political backing to an Arab League plan to begin a negotiated transition was that they uh, put a, a stake in the heart of efforts to resolve this conflict peacefully. While the U.N. Security Council measure has failed, the U.S. government doesn't want to jump to military action, but is not ruling it out. I don't want to get into speculation, but I do think that, that our aim has been throughout uh, to use diplomacy, uh, sanctions, and economic pressure uh, to uh, make it absolutely clear to Assad that his days are numbered, which indeed they are, uh, and that there needs to be a transition to a representative democratic uh, government in Syria. With the increasing violence in Syria, the Obama administration has closed down the Syrian embassy and pulled out all diplomats. I'm Ryan Jones, back to you in the studio. Thanks, Ryan. There's no doubt this year's Super Bowl was a nail-biter until the finish, but it wasn't just the Giants and the Patriots who were under pressure. This weekend, the city of Indianapolis was responsible for keeping thousands of fans safe, something that can be difficult when everyone is there to celebrate. Daily Iowa TV's Nick Rector has a story on how police kept peace during the ride of the game. Just four years ago in Super Bowl 42, Eli Manning and the Giants upset the Patriots and kept them from a perfect season. So last night's Super Bowl 46 matchup was the perfect opportunity for the Patriots to get some payback and respect. Viewers weren't let down either as the game was everything it was made up to be. It was a great matchup and the team swapped points evenly throughout the game. Yet in the end, the Giants proved to be too strong and beat out the Patriots 21-17, securing another Super Bowl ring for Eli Manning and his boys. Last night's matchup between the Giants and the Patriots was huge, but how exactly did a small market city like Indianapolis put up with so many traveling fans this past weekend? Now normally the Super Bowl is held in big cities like Dallas or Miami, but this year it was held in Indianapolis, who has a population of only 800,000 people. People were left wondering, could Indianapolis host such a big event, and more importantly, would it be safe? 1,000 public safety officers were placed in the downtown and Super Bowl Village areas of Indianapolis, while four police helicopters flew above. The helicopters took video footage that was sent live to a high-tech center where police officials watched closely and acted when necessary. This kept things safe as only 51 arrests and 25 minor injuries were reported between 7 p.m. on Saturday and 7 a.m. on Sunday. It's said that these cameras were good enough to capture someone's facial expression, so I'm sure police saw a lot of sad patriot faces by the end of Sunday night. Nick Rector, Daily Iowan TV. And now, we'll go beyond Iowa City to take a look at some of the top stories of the day. At least three are dead in what authorities suspect was a murder-suicide in Washington State. Josh Powell and his two sons are believed to be dead in what police think was a deliberately set house fire. One neighbor described the scene. I was in my living room just watching the pregame and there was a big explosion, it shook the house. I just knew that if there was anyone in there, they didn't survive. You could tell that instantly from what we saw. Powell was also a suspect in the mysterious disappearance of his ex-wife in West Valley City, Utah, two years ago, though no charges were ever filed against him in that case. 
And you've heard of condom machines and restrooms, but students at Shippenburg University in Pennsylvania can now purchase emergency contraceptive Plan B from a vending machine at the Campus Health Center. 85% of students survey, surveyed said they were in favor of providing Plan B, which also av is available over the counter to anyone 17 years and older. Officials with the university say that making it available through a vending machine is, more is a more comfortable means for students to, protect, to practice safer sex. And it wasn't a wardrobe malfunction that stirred up some controversy for the halftime show of Super Bowl 46. During Madonna's halftime performance, British singer M.I.A. flipped the middle finger at a camera. The network tried cutting away from the obscene gesture, but was too late and it was shown on live television. Officials with the NFL and NBC have apologized for the diva's actions. And with all the media attention leading up to Super Bowl 46, there's also been some pretty major news regarding Hawkeye football. Let's toss it to Nick Robertson to get your Hawkeye Sports update. Iowa's coaching search has expanded. Offensive coordinator Ken O'Keefe is moving out of Iowa City after 13 seasons at the head of, of the Hawkeye offense. O'Keefe will be taking his talents to South Beach, where the NFL's Miami Dolphins hired him as their wide receivers coach. This move le leaves both Iowa coordinators' positions vacant after Norm Parker retired from his defensive coordinator job at the end of this season. Both O'Keefe and Parker came to Iowa in 1999 with head coach Kirk Ferentz 13 years ago. There will be a press conference on Wednesday with coach, coach Kirk Ferentz, but it is not known at this time if decisions on either position will be made. And moving to basketball, the Hawks cruised to an easy 77-64 victory against Penn State over the weekend, but the game took a back seat to the pregame festivities honoring Iowa's last Elite Eight team. Daily Iowan TV's Mike Howell went to the game on Saturday and has more. There was a cause for excitement in the air in Carver Hawkeye Arena on Saturday, but before fans could cheer on Devin Marble and his teammates, Hawkeye fans got a chance to cheer on Roy Marble and his. 1986-87 squad was in town, and the Hawkeyes brought out the cursive Iowa jerseys, worn in the mid-80s to honor them. The players signed autographs before the game and were honored before the tip-off, and former head coach Tom Davis was given a ball commemorating the season. Davis, Iowa's winningest head coach and 1987 AP National Coach of the Year, said it was great to be back and see everyone who was involved with the team. And so I was surrounded by some really talented people off the court as well as on the court. So to see a lot of them here uh, last night at the reception and then again today is, means a lot to me. The 1987 team set numerous records. They won 30 games, they won their first 18 games, had eight players drafted to the NBA, and is the last Iowa Hawkeye basketball team to reach the Elite Eight in the NCAA tournament. These accomplishments might seem light years away from this year's basketball team, but Davis says it looks like a work in progress. Well, I think they're on the right track. I think Coach, you know, Coach McCaffrey is well prepared to do this job, and I like what he says and what he does and the way they're playing. They need more players. There's no, I mean, there's no if ands, or buts about it that you. The game itself, however, was a blowout. The Hawks had a 20-point lead for most of the game, in similar fashion to the 1987 team that won its games by an average of 16 points. Mike Howell, Daily Iowan TV Sports. More bad news for the injury-ridden women's basketball team as leading scorer Jamie Printy will miss the rest of the season with an ACL injury. The junior suffered her second torn left ACL during Iowa's 85-79 overtime victory at Wisconsin last week. The Hawkeyes won their first game without Printy Sunday, 83-64 at Indiana, with freshman Melissa Dixon starting in place of Printy and scoring a career-high 19 points. So, Though there's some good news, there's also some bad news in the women's basketball. Back to you guys. And before we leave you tonight, check this out. Donuts and exercise already seem like a major contradiction of each other, right? However, people in Raleigh, North Carolina would say otherwise. The 8th Annual Krispy Kreme Challenge took place over the weekend. Participants started at the Bell Tower on the North Carolina State campus and had to run two and a half miles, scarf down a dozen donuts, then run another two and a half miles. The event raised more than $120,000 for a local hospital. And only with Daily Iowan TV can you get a sneak peek into the print version of Tuesday's Daily Iowan. Read about the Hawkeye wrestlers' recent tournament victory. And read about the connection between UI tuition and president salary rates. 
Well, that's your Monday edition of Daily Iowan TV. Be sure to check us out at the same time tomorrow or anytime online at dailyiowan.com. Thanks for watching and have a great night.